Thank you, Mrs. Green. What a great song, great thought for us that we will try to fill up that space with a lot of things in our life, but only Jesus can satisfy with lasting satisfaction. Thank you for that, Mrs. Green. If you have your Bibles, open to the book of Jonah. Open to the book of Jonah. We've been dealing with storms uh, this week, last week, the next couple weeks as I preach. And uh, Jonah talks about a big storm. Now, if you're looking for it, you may miss it. And so mine's about a page in there, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, or Obadiah, Jonah. And so it's right there in the Old Testament, squished between a couple books. And we have the, the ever-known popular story of Jonah and the whale. Now, if you happen to look in your Bible, in your King James Version, you'll see in chapter 1 that it does not say whale, it says great fish. You're like, oh no, we have a problem. I've always heard it was a whale. What do I do? Don't, don't worry. Jesus in Matthew calls it a whale, so it's okay. So you can call it a big fish or whale. You'll be okay either way. Old Testament, New Testament, it was something very, very big. But you can't come to church once again, like I said last week, very often, very long in Sunday school, and not hear about Jonah being swallowed by the whale, can you? I mean, what a great story to tell little kids. You know, listen, little kids, if you don't obey, Dad, don't go near the water because you're going to get swallowed up. All right, listen, if you don't go to bed and sleep well, what'll happen? Next time you go to the pool, a big fish is going to swallow you up. I mean, you can use this for anything in life. You can threaten your kids for, for, forever on this, Jonah and, and, the, and the whale. And boy, you can act it out, and you can, you can read accounts of fishermen that survived in a whale. You can look it up, not now, but you'll see people, and they're like, their hair is bleached white. They look like a freakish, you know, humanoid, okay? It, it's a scary sight. And people have tried forever to discount the story of Jonah and the whale to think there's no way that a man could have survived down there. But we know it to be true for a couple reasons. One, because God said it was true. Amen. So if God said it's true, then it is true. Well, how is it possible? I don't know. But God said it, so it happened. It's possible. This story was told here, or this account was told here in Jonah, repeated in Matthew, twice in Matthew, and also in Luke. It is uh, backed up by the New Testament. You say, well, of course it's in the Bible, but understand these books were written thousands of years apart on different continents, in different languages, and they keep some details surprisingly similar. That's amazing. Amen? That your Bible is accurate, even though it was written on different continents and different languages by different men, but all inspired by the Holy Ghost. Well, we come to the story of, of this storm, Jonah and the whale. And last week I began when we talked about Noah, how often when a storm comes in our life, we think it's a problem from God. I would say the same thing is true with this story, that when something bad happens, you get a flat tire. You lose your job, and we think, oh no, I'm like Jonah, what have I done? What I want to do this morning is I want to tell you what I believe the purpose of this storm is. I'm going to go like to the end of my message and explain the purpose, and then back it up for the next few minutes. Fair enough? Kind of a different approach to this thing. Because often in our life, we will think when something bad happens that God is judging me. Do we not? We instantly think, oh boy, what have I done? Well, I only spent 30 minutes in my Bible and not four hours. And so if I were to spend four hours, then God will be happy and then I won't be judged any longer. I'll get out of this, this storm. Do we not? Oh no! This bill came, and I, my prayer life has not been as good as it should be. So, boy, as soon as I begin to pray again, then this storm will be over. We begin to pray again, and, and the storm doesn't seem to be over. Oh, boy, what have I done now? I've done something horribly wrong. I don't even know about it. Isn't that how our mind works? And I think, or I know that we miss the purpose of this storm right here. You see... This storm, I believe, is a sound. What would you say the worst sound known to man is? What would you say, it, what is a sound that can send you into a bigger mental tailspin quicker than anything else in the world? What is a sound that can cause you to completely lose your mind and your thoughts and your thinking? What is that sound? I would submit to you. That the most hor horrific and terrible, mind-numbing, soul-binding sound known to man is the alarm clock. I brought with me, could you turn on this mic, please, Brother Pat, and this, this center mic? Some alarm clock sounds. Is this one on now? Thank you. I got more.
and I have like 30 of them. How many have been woken from a wonderful, relaxing, peaceful, godly, deep sleep by the horrible, satanic sound of an alarm clock before? And how many awake with that alarm clock and just think, wow, this is wonderful. Praise the Lord, I'm not going to be late. Or how many are like, ah! You ever woken up and just in a state of just panic where you don't know where you are and what's happened? Anybody done that before? Oh, man, or that alarm clock you hear, and you're like, oh, my goodness. This past Tuesday, um, I was able to, or past Wednesday morning, I took Brother Fong, who preached Tuesday night on the Passion, on Passion and, and Life. He went to the airport Wednesday morning, but his flight was canceled Tuesday night, so he had to go to Detroit Wednesday morning. So pastor asked, you know, we want to take him? I said, sure, I'd be glad to. He said, well, you have to pick him up at 3.15 in the morning. So I set my alarm for 2.40 a.m. No one should be up at 2.40 in the morning, especially not me. 3.15, 3.30, but oh, man, that alarm clock goes off, and I just like, I'm like, oh, like spinning around. What, what's going on? Then, I, then it all comes flooding back to me. I would submit that that alarm clock sound has just, I mean, ruined lives, ruined lives. Because when you jerk awake, your heart's beating like the thousand miles a minute, right? You lost some time of your life right now, that alarm clock. But I would submit that this storm, that the storm that Jonah was in, the storm that God created was God's alarm clock for Jonah. The storm was not God's judgment. The fish was God's judgment. But this storm was a wake-up call. Now that's where I'm going this morning. And now I'm going to prove it from the scripture. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for loving us. I thank you for your word. I thank you for these lessons from storms. I pray you'd guide me this morning. Give me wisdom, strength, and knowledge. But Lord, help your word to be as powerful as it is and you promised it to be. May nothing hinder it this morning. In Jesus' name, I ask. Amen. So now I want to support why I believe that this storm is God's alarm clock. If you look in Jonah chapter 1, verse number 1, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, or of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Now I preached a few weeks back on this concept. I will not spend a lot of time here. But this first point is the prelude to the storm. The prelude to the storm. So before the storm comes, there's no storm yet, right? Right? No storm? No boat, right? No whale, right? There's just Jonah lying in bed, and God's word comes to him. The word of the Lord, verse number one, very clear. Did Jonah, help me here, did Jonah have any doubt who was speaking? Yes or no? He knew it was who? God. He knew it was God speaking. So before the storm came, God spoke to him, and there was a request and a responsibility. Jonah, arise and go to Nineveh and cry against it, for its wickedness is very great. If you know anything about Nineveh, you knew that it was just a terrible, terrible land. They had terrible tortures of people when they conquered cities, when they conquered cultures. They would do terrible things that would make us blush if we were to speak of them, of, of, of all of them. All right, they would do things like, uh, partly they'd have a spike on the ground, and they'd throw people up on the spike and let them kind of like slide down the spike. Nineveh was a terrible, terrible city, a wicked city. God said their wickedness was so great it came to him in his ears, in his cry. That's how great, uh, how bad it was. I wonder, I cannot prove this from Scripture, but I wonder if Jonah's life was touched by the Ninevites before. I wonder if he had been touched by their culture, by their cruelty before. I don't know that. He had definitely heard about them. He knew how bad they were. And God's word came. It was very, very clear. And before the storm came, God came to Jonah and he said, Jonah, this is what I want you to do. But we have those three little words. Last week, we preached on Noah. The Bible says God saw the wickedness that was very great in the earth, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Remember, Noah was different. In verse number two, we have a similar phrase. We have, but Jonah. But this one wasn't positive. It doesn't say, but Jonah rose up and ran to Nineveh. I wish it did. It didn't say, it doesn't say, but Jonah rose up, grabbed 30 other prophets, and took them with him and prophesied against Nineveh. 
It says, but Jonah, and it says he rose up to flee into Tarshish. So not only do we have the request and responsibility from, from God, we have Jonah's refusal and his rebellion. You see, Jonah, and I preached on this a few weeks back, like I said, Jonah pretended to obey. You know, God said, arise, and Jonah rose up. He did that part. He did part of it. But God said, arise and go to Nineveh, and Jonah arose and ran to flee to Tarshish. The Bible tells us to flee from the rebellion, or to flee from the presence of the Lord. He said, I've got to get away from you, Lord. I cannot handle what you're asking me to do. What you've asked me to do is too hard. What you want me to do is too great. I can't do it. Not only can I not do it, I don't want to do it. At the end of Jonah, Jonah tells us why he did not want to go to Nineveh. He didn't want to go to Nineveh, not because he was afraid of his life. He might have been, but that's not why he refused to go. He didn't go because he was afraid he was going to die. The Bible, Jonah's own words, he said, Lord, I knew. He said, I knew that thou wouldst have mercy. Verse, uh, chapter 4, verse number 2. Was this not my saying when, they, when I was yet in my country? For I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful and slow to anger and of great kindness and repentance thee of the evil. Jonah said, the reason I'm not going is because I know what you're going to do, God. I know exactly what you're going to do. You're going to be merciful to those Ninevites. You're going to save them. You're going to show kindness to, the, to those people. And I don't want you to show kindness to those people right there. Do you not see the rebellion that, that Jonah's displaying? The rebellion? And listen, we do the same thing in our life. God will come and speak clearly. He'll speak plainly. He might be speaking to you this morning. For some people, it may be that you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. And he said, listen, you need to deal with that today. And you say, no, I don't want to. It may be he came to you as a Christian and says, listen, you need to be kind to this person, your coworker, who's an absolute jerk. And you're like, you know what, Lord, I do not want to be kind to that person. Do you not know how cruel they are to me at work? Do you not understand how mean they are? He may come to you and say, listen, you need to love your wife as Christ of the church. Lord, I can't love my wife. Do you know how she treats me? She married me. That was horrible. Well... I would say this, when God speaks, respond to him. When God speaks, respond to him. For some, it may be to a wife, and God is saying, listen, you need to honor and to follow your husband. Lord, I can't do that. Do you not know how big of an idiot my husband is? Yeah, I know him too. Doesn't change your responsibility. And so God came to Jonah. He spoke to him like he often speaks to us. And our job is to respond to him. Not just to listen, but to respond to him. At our house, I'll often call the kids. And for a little while there, they, just re they would just respond like this. I'd say, hey, you know, hey, Johnny. And from the other room, he'd say, yes, sir. I said, that's fine. But Johnny, if I call you, I probably want something. So come, come to me, all right? Come to me. That's why, kids, do you come to me and serve me, okay? I need something to drink. No, no. And I may need something, all right? I'm, I was doing a project, and I'm like, hey, Johnny. So he finally wanders in there. I'm like holding this thing half up and half down about to fall over, okay? Well, I need you to come. When God speaks, we're supposed to respond. Roger Boysjoy knew that the Challenger space shuttle might fail catastrophically. And he tried to stop its launch. But NASA refused to acknowledge his objections. Boys Jolly was a rocket engineer who worked for a company that NASA contracted with. He noticed that the Challenger's booster rockets had a major design flaw, that their elastic seals had a tendency to stiffen and unseal in cold weather. The Challenger was scheduled for winter launch, and Boys Jolly knew that the temperatures would be too low for the booster rocket seals to handle even in Florida. He convinced his colleagues that they formally recommend NASA to delay the launch. However, as you all know, NASA ignored that recommendation. And sure enough, the SEALs failed, leading to the explosion of the entire Challenger space shuttle less than two minutes after it was launched. I still remember that launch, the Challenger, seeing it go up. With a, it was a teacher on board from Florida, and all the, the it was touted about this launch, and watching that live and then seeing that thing explode? Unbelievable. And to know that someone said, hey, 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 wait, 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 going to be a problem. 
Can I submit to you that God will come to us through his word, through his preaching, through our friends, and say, hey, hey, wait, wait, and he'll speak to you. But he wants you to respond to him. Well, Jonah didn't respond. And so from the prelude to the storm, we have the plea in the storm. We have the plea in the storm. What happened? Well, the Bible tells in verse number four that the Lord sent out a great wind. They got, became agitated. The sailors, the sailors who were seasoned became afraid for their life. Verse number four and verse number five, they, were, they thought the ship was going to be broken, and they began to just empty the ship out. They did everything they thought they could to solve the problem, which is the same thing that we do. God speaks, life takes a turn for the worse, and we say, oh no, I better do everything I think I can do to solve this problem. Like I mentioned, we'll begin to now pray very fervently because that'll solve the problem. We'll say, oh, i got to get my Bible, so I'll just read my Bible for hours. I'll be in church now every single service because I am trying to solve the problem. But those things could not solve the problem. The problem was not that there was too much in the boat. You get it? The problem was not that it was too weighted down. The problem was not that they were going the wrong. The problem was that God had sent the storm to wake up Jonah. So they're agitated. They're cried every man to his God. And I see the scripture said that, and I thought, I wonder what it would have been like on that boat when all these sailors are crying to their own God. Man, what, I mean, what a mess that would have been. And this one's crying maybe to, to Baal, and, and this one's crying to a different, maybe to Molech, and this one's crying to a different God. This one's crying to the sun, and to the sea, and to the whales, and to the fish, and to the, to the ants. I don't know. Oh, great ants, save us from the storm, whatever you can do. Oh, tadpoles, whatever it may be. They're all crying to their gods. Anything they can do to solve this problem. Then they realize something, that Jonah's not crying to his God. Jonah's not there tossing things off the boat. Verse number five. I'm sorry, end of verse number four. But Jonah was gone down to the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. Jonah was sleeping through the storm. Now, I believe it's next week we'll deal with when Jesus slept through the storm. We have two people who slept through the storm, but they slept for entirely different reasons. Jonah slept through the storm because he didn't care. He was running from God. It was better if he would just perish. Jonah did not care what happened. He's asleep, and in danger he slept. He was running away from God and asleep. He was going through the motions, but asleep. But can I make this comparison? That often in our spiritual life, when we run from God, we then become asleep spiritually. We're in the boat, per se, but we're asleep. We don't know what's going on. We can sit in the pew. We can, we can go through the motions, but we're just fast asleep. There's some crazy things that have happened while people were asleep. There's a couple, a Muslim couple, that were divorced. After in his sleep, the man uttered these words, talak, three times during his sleep. In that country, it equals a divorce. In India. They were happily married, but because he uttered it while he's asleep, they still got divorced. In England, police were called where a young girl was seen climbing a 130-foot-high crane. This 15-year-old, naturally, they assumed it was likely a suicide attempt, so they arrived and began to investigate when they found out that this 15-year-old, while she was climbing, was still actually asleep while she was climbing. And upon waking her up, they brought her down and get her back to safety. Not even as crazy, though, you'll remember Pastor Fusco was here. Here's back, we're on a senior trip. The senior trip, and we're in a hotel room, and he had told me that if he gets really tired, he would say things. So I'm sitting there reading my Bible. Pastor Fusco's there, and he's asleep, sleep. All of a sudden, he goes like this. He goes, hey, baby. You know what I did? I grabbed my phone to record it. <laughs> and I said, this will be the best thing known to man. I can't wait to get this on footage. And I'm sitting there with my phone just waiting, just waiting. And he won't say anything else. And so I said, hey, hey, Fusco, hey, Fusco. He's snoring. I can't get him to say anything else. I was so disappointed in my life. But what's even more crazy is that Christians 
will try to live their life while spiritually asleep. The dads will try to run their families and raise their kids while they're asleep spiritually in the bottom of the boat. Well, moms will try to be a mom and, and try to be a good mom, but they'll be spiritually asleep in the bottom of the boat, fast asleep. While Sunday school teachers and nursery workers and bus captains will try to go through the motions and just be asleep spiritually. Because they've heard from God, God has spoken to them, and they've said, no, I won't do that. You see, while Jonah was asleep, nothing was getting done that was right. But then I see Jonah was awakened. Verse number six, the shipmaster comes down there, and he wakes him up, and, and he says, what are you doing down here? He was awakened, awakened by the man in charge of the boat. I had the thought, I wonder what it'll take to wake some of us up. I wonder, it'll be a, I wonder if it'll be a calamity of life or a storm just to wake up. The thing is, Jonah should have been awake. Jonah should have never been on the boat. He should have been headed toward Nineveh. He was awake, and then he was accused. Verse number seven. They said, all right, let's figure this out. So they went to each other, and they, they, the Bible says they cast lots. Kind of like a dice game, and, and probably, most likely, they... Uh, the, the, the scholars say they just kind of roll dice or maybe they use straws or said, okay, you know, it's between this group and this group. And then they would say, okay, it's not this group, it's this group. And they, between these, you know, four guys, these two. And eventually got down and it came right to Jonah. The Lord used this game, this little odds game, to point out that it was Jonah's fault. They said, Jonah, what have you done? Jonah says, well, I'm a Hebrew. And notice something, and I think it's verse number seven. Let me get up here and look. He says something that caught me off guard. Verse number nine. He said to them, I am an Hebrew. Look at that with me. And it says, and I, what the Lord, the God of heaven. What does it say? Fear. Now, think of the irony. Where is Jonah? Where is he? On a boat. Where is he headed? Tarshish. Where did God say to go? Nineveh. So is he fearing the Lord right now? No way. No way. When the other people were crying to their God, the God who could solve this, was he prayed to? No, because where was Jonah? Asleep in the bottom of the boat. So think of the gall to say, oh, I'm in Hebrew and I fear the God. I worship, I follow, I reverence the God of the, of the, of the, the, God of the Hebrews, all right, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. He said, listen, I'm okay. I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of this God. Jonah, not right now you're not. You're not okay, Jonah. Do you, look where you're at. Look what's happening. Well, then the men said, verse number 11, what shall we do? <laughs> and he said, take me up, verse number 12, and throw me in the water. He said, okay, you can solve this problem. Just, just throw me in. You see, Jonah was chosen. He was questioned. He was disregarded. They ignored him. They begin to row. The men begin to row the boat. And they said, oh, we can solve this ourselves. Row, row, row the boat gently down the stream. Didn't get anywhere. But verse number 15, Jonah was chucked right into the water. And as soon as he touched the water, the sea ceased from her raging. The storm stopped. Because as verse 16 tells us, that the men feared in 17, the Lord had prepared a great fish. Eventually, this storm got Jonah's attention. And not only Jonah's attention, it got attention of everyone else on that boat, the shipmaster, the sailors, it got all their attention. And the only way to solve it was to do what God wanted them to do. Now think about this. The sailors responded quicker to God, God's instruction, than Jonah did. God had said to Jonah, arise and go to Nineveh. Jonah said, nope, I'm not going, I'm going to Tarshish. But in the boat, Jonah says, the only way to solve this is to throw me in the water. It was God's plan, now throw him in the water. So they did. They threw him in. And the wind ceased. You see, this storm was to wake Jonah up. To get his attention. When you ignore God, he will often get your attention. Hebrew tells us that for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Matthew 23, 37 says, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen? 
and you would not. So we come down to the end of it now, this storm. Purpose of the storm to wake him up. You say, Brother Howell, it's nice you, you give this account of the storm, but why do you think that's the purpose? Well, for two reasons. Purpose of the storm, in chapter 2, we see Jonah's repentance. Chapter 2, the whole chapter is Jonah praying till the end that he's eventually vomited back up on the shore. And Jonah, after three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, finally repents. And Jonah, in his prayer in chapter 2, he says, you've taken me down to the depths of hell. He doesn't say that you took me through the storm of the sea. Jonah says clearly in chapter 2 that when you put me in the depths of this, that's when you got my, when I repented. See, the Lord had prepared a great fish. The fish is where Jonah had to learn his lesson. The storm was just to wake him up to get him right here. The storm was just the alarm clock so that Jonah would repent. You see, we think the storm is God's judgment. But think with me, parents. Most of you parents, if not all of you, have disciplined your kids before, have you not? Maybe as a child you've been disciplined. What kind of parent would I be if I go home today and I grab my kids and just begin to beat them? What kind of parent would I be? Daddy, what are you doing? You know what? You should know what you're, you know, you should know what you're getting beat for. I'd be a terrible father, would I not be? I've never, I've never just grabbed my kids and start beating them or disciplining them or whatever it may be or spanking them without them knowing what the issue was. What kind of father is God? He's a loving father. He's a caring father. He's clear. And we think that God just begins to discipline us without any clear explanation. Oh, I'm in this storm. Must be God's judgment. Well, why? I don't know. I'm just, this is something wrong. I'm sure I'll look at it. I'll figure it out. Oh, yeah, I missed, I missed my devotions one time last week. So that's why my house burned, up to the, burned down to the ground. We, we, pretend, we, we think that, that God is somehow waiting up there, waiting us for us to make one small misstep, Right? Right, that's the thoughts that come to our mind. And when we make one small misstep, he's like, aha, I got him. Now I want to really pour on him. Hey, guys, watch this storm. I want to pour on this person because they really, really messed up. They didn't hand a track to that gas station attendant. I'm going to get him now. It's not what God's doing. He's our heavenly father. He loves to get good gifts, but he wants your attention. He wants you to respond to him. He wants you to listen to him. He wants you to obey him. And when we don't, Sometimes it'll bring a storm so that we'll wake up and say, wait a second. But don't forget, before the storm came, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. It was not a secret. God did not mask what he wanted from Jonah. He did not say to Jonah, I hope you can figure it out there, big guy. It wasn't a clue game. It wasn't a scavenger hunt. He came and says, Jonah, I want you to do this. And Jonah said, I don't want to. Then the storm came. Say, Jonah, wake up. I need your attention. And listen, friend. God will often speak to us. He'll speak clearly. He'll come through his word. And he'll say, I want you to do this. You know what we ought to do? Do that. Respond to him. You see, when God speaks, when God speaks, he wants us to respond to him. Purpose of the storm, they got Jonah out of the boat. And they got Jonah from his intended goal, from Tarshish to Nineveh. So I wonder if sometimes God is trying to get your attention or my attention. It always begins with clear instruction. But when we reject and rebel, God sometimes sends a storm. Not to judge us, but to wake us up. As I finish preparing for this sermon, I wonder, like I often do, what could have been different. I begin to wonder, what if, at the beginning of that storm, if Jonah had quickly said, 
hey guys, quickly, turn the boat around. We got to go to Nineveh. I wonder what could have been. I wonder if Jonah had gotten up when they're all crying to their gods and, and got on his face and said, God, forgive me. Get me to Nineveh. I wonder what could have been. I wonder how the story w- would have ended up. I wonder where the storm would have maybe ceased then. Yet Jonah took a while to wake up. It took him getting wet. May we not have to get wet to wake up. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that you love us so much that you want to get our attention. Lord, you don't do it out of anger or spite, but out of love. And Lord, I pray that as you speak to us, we'd respond. Lord, if there's someone here this morning who say, Brother Howell, as you were speaking, I know that God has been speaking to me. And I need to respond to him today. I don't want to ignore him like Jonah did. I don't want to flee from his presence. But would you pray for me that I would respond like I ought to? I don't want to be like a Jonah. I want to, I want to respond to God. Would you pray for me this morning with that raised hand? God spoke to me today. Amen. Amen. Hands all over. Amen. 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 Who else? Amen. What if there's someone here who would say, Brother Howell, as you're speaking, I realize that God is speaking to me, but I've never trusted Christ as my Savior. And I would love to trust him as my Savior today, and I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? I want to respond to God in salvation today. Would you pray for me when you pray with the others? Who is anyone like that this morning? With that praise hand, I'll pray for you just like I pray for the others. I'll draw no more attention to you than the others, but I'd love to pray for you. you say, I've not trusted Christ as my Savior, but I'd like to. I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. Would you pray for me? Amen. See that hand or other others? Amen. See that? Amen. Lord, I pray for this time that we'd respond, that we'd not be like Jonah, or we'd listen to your clear instruction. Bless this time of invitation, in Jesus' name.